Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of April 17th, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why we believe some don't understand the depth of Alaska's fiscal hole. Second, we discuss the dynamics at work in drafting this year's budget. And third, we explain why Senator Stedman's amendment yesterday to SB 107 isn't about paying for POMV 5050, it's about burying the PFD. And now, let's join Michael. Let's start off uh, here in the weekly top three. We've got a lot to cover. I don't know if we're going to be able to make it an hour. I might have to nail you down and get you into hour two, but let's see. Uh, first thing is, is that nobody really understands the problem. Nobody really seems, uh, apparently, from what we're seeing in the headlines and everything else, some just not understanding the depth of the fiscal problem. Uh, let's get started. Uh, let's get started on that. Well, in the Anchorage Daily News, uh, we talked about uh, Matt Berman, uh, ISER professor Matt Berman's piece uh, last week, uh, op-ed piece, where he talked about what his proposed solution to uh, the fiscal uh, uh, problems. And I think it's a great, I think Matt has a great solution. I wrote about it on Friday in the Alaska Landmine column. But in response to that, <clears throat> Al Belay, who I know uh, and respect generally, uh, wrote an op-ed that said it, it, that was headlined an even better way to balance Alaska's budget, and it's a it's an idea. His idea is one that's been bouncing around a lot. Uh, others have expressed it as well, and that is to means test or needs test uh, the PFD. That the PFD would not be given to everyone; it would only be given to those that fall below a certain category. The the people are a certain income level. The the people that 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 believe in that. Uh, I think have the have the impression that if the top twenty percent, for example, just gave up their PFD, uh, or the top twenty five percent would give up their PFD, it it all be over. You know that satisfy the deficit, and uh, and everybody could have their PFD, and and we we go along fat and happy. That's not true. It's not even close to being true. Uh, I did a piece a while back that I went back and did the meth took the methodology, updated the numbers. Um, and and here's here's what we're facing. We've, we're facing over the next ten years a deficit, an annual deficit, annual average deficit over the next ten years of roughly two billion dollars or two billion dollars um, a year. That's thirty five percent of spending. Thirty five percent of the of the spending levels are going to be have to be covered by something else. They're going to be in deficit. Put another way, revenues are only sufficient. Traditional revenues are only sufficient to cover sixty five percent of spending. We're going to have to come up with 35%. If we entirely eliminated the PFD to the top 25% using IRS data, uh, if we entirely eliminated uh, the PFDs to the top 20%, that would only raise $900 million, 45% of the deficit. We'd still have 55% of the deficit uh, uh, remaining, even if we eliminated PFDs entirely to the top 25% just said, okay, we're going to, we're only going to focus uh, uh, PFDs on middle and lower income Alaska families, top 25%, no, uh, no PFDs. On, that only covers 45% uh, of the deficit. We'd still have 
roughly $1.1 billion out of the $2 billion uh, of, of deficit left to go. That means we would have to cut, if, if we're going down that road and we're gonna and we're gonna eliminate the PFD to the top 25%, we would still have to cut 60% of the PFD of the statutory PFD to the remaining 75%. To fill the deficit, there wouldn't even be there wouldn't even remotely be enough uh, uh, remaining uh, of the PFD uh, to after closing the deficit to uh, uh, to to fund the full PFD for the remaining seventy five percent. It would only be sixty percent. The other way to look at it is how much, how many could we could we fully fund the PFD to if we if we just you know eliminated the PFD for. Uh, uh, for everybody else, uh, eliminated the deficit by using, you know, PFD elimination for everybody else. How many could get the full PFD after we did that? And it'd be, we could pay the full, full PFD only to the bottom 140,000, which is roughly the bottom 35% uh, of Alaska families or, or Alaskans, uh, the bottom. So that means to, to pay off the deficit using this means testing approach, if the means testing approach would mean we're going to pay the full PFD to somebody, we're just going to eliminate it for everybody else um, and, and only pay it to, uh, to those below a certain level. We'd have to eliminate it to, the, to 65% of Alaska families uh, in order to pay the full PFD uh, uh, to the remaining, uh, remaining 35%. Not only would the top 25%, top 20% have to have to contribute theirs, not only would the top 25% have to contribute theirs, the top 65%, middle income Alaska families, uh, would have to would have to have the elimination, would have to face the elimination of the PFD in order to in order to pay a full PFD to the to the remaining 35% of Alaska families. We're facing the purpose of these numbers is we're facing some huge deficits going forward. I mean, 35% of the budget um, is going to be in deficit, huge deficits going forward. And I, and, and people think we can get away with, oh, we'll just eliminate the, the PFD to the top 20% or we'll eliminate the PFD to the top 25% or we'll eliminate the, the PFD to the top 50%. Um, it's just, <laughs> it's just that, that, that the, the numbers are just too staggering to be able to do that. Yeah. Numbers still don't work. Uh, I thought he tipped his hand in this piece which I posted up in the chat room, this opinion piece from Al Balea. Uh, I thought he tipped his hand at the very end when he says, whatever funds are freed up from this change can be used for critical public services and education. <laughs> Acting like this will be extra free money. That's what I mean, I get, right? Am I, when, I, when you read it that way, you're like, all the money freed up from this can be spent on other things. And I'm like, wait a second, we've got a huge deficit and you want to spend it on other things? This would This would just take up a portion of the... I mean, it's but this is the this is the feel. It's not your money. It's the government's money. We should do with it as we want. Blah 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 blah. There you go. Yeah, it's uh, I just people just don't have just don't have a good feel for the numbers. I mean, they they think so. So Elise Galvin's proposal that she presented last night to uh, to House Ways and Means. We talked about it last week, but it's another example of not having a good feel the number for the numbers. Her her proposal is an income tax. 2% flat tax on, on incomes above $200,000. So the, the first $200,000 is exempt. Income above $200,000 would be subject to a flat tax. And then, and then the remainder would be, would be raised, or the remainder of her proposal would be raised through a head tax, a $20 head tax. That barely scratches the surface. We're facing, we're facing $2 billion deficits. Her proposal uh, raises maybe $150 million. And if you look at just the income, the because the the head tax proposal is just is just another way of recharacterizing PFD cuts. It doesn't actually add any revenue. You're going to have to cut PFDs deeply in order to balance the budget, even with her proposal. Um, and so you're just really recharacterizing twenty dollars of the PFD cut as a as a head tax as opposed to a PFD cut. So skip that. The proposed income tax that she's got raises, you know, $75 million, somewhere between $75 million and $100 million, depending upon how many out-of-state residents we have with income above, above $200,000. But at most, it raises, it raises $100 million against a deficit of $2 billion. 
and she and 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 you know those who are backing it and those who are who are saying well it's a major step forward are saying you know this is this is really a, a solid proposal no it's not it's as we called it last week it's a fig leaf it it is you, you, you don't have if you think that's a solid proposal on the way forward you don't have a good grasp on the on the numbers that we're facing the deficits we're facing uh going forward uh, because it's just, it's, 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 it's a drop in the bucket. It's a hundred million dollars out of, out of a $2 billion uh, annual deficit that we're facing going forward. Same thing with Al's. I mean, Al, Al Belay's, you know, he, he, you know, it's a real proposal by gosh, the tw top 20% or the top 20% just ought to give up their PFDs. Let's focus it on, uh, let's focus it on, on the remainder of Alaska families. And as you say, you know, we'll have a little bit left over. You know, his his concept right, is right. We'll, we'll have a little bit left over. No, you won't. <laughs> I mean, if the the deficit's two billion dollars, if you give up, if the top twenty five percent, every last one of them gives up their PFD, their full PFD, that only raises nine hundred nine hundred million dollars. We still got a yeah. billion one to go, <laughs> and 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 people just don't have. I mean, they don't have a grasp on how deep a hole we've dug ourselves into. Right. Well, and they're not, again, they're not thinking long-term. You know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of that, that old analogy about, you know, triage and you stumble in with a bleeding femoral artery and the gal's like, let me put a Band-Aid on that. That'll be fine. Don't worry about that. And that's what it feels like. I mean, it just feels like, do you guys not understand the depth of what we're talking about here? And again, the reaction of Bolea to say, oh, all this, with all the funds we freed up, we could, we'll be able to use that on critical public services. and everything. It's going to suck up all the money in the room. Are you kidding me? And you know what's going to happen? Even it, let, let's say we just say just for a moment. Let's say we adopted it. And so we've got 35% of Alaska, the remaining 35% of the Alaska families getting the getting the full PFD. How long is it going to be until somebody says, well, that's just welfare. We need to cut the welfare. And so, and so, you know, they don't, they don't need all that. So we'll just take, you know, 5,000 here, 5,000 there. And how long is that going to last? I mean, once you once you've converted the PFD, which is a share, let's let's go back to the fundamentals. It is a share of Alaska's wealth for every. Every man will turn the PFD into a welfare payment, which is basically what this proposal is. How long do you think it's going to last until people just start, you know, cutting it down and cutting it down and cutting it down um, uh, even further until it's gone? It's just it, right. it's a step on the road of, of eliminating the PFD uh, through through another means. And, you know, I, I just prefer somebody come in my face and say, I just want to wipe out the PFD and argue about that as opposed to this nickel and dime approach of, well, we'll eliminate it to the top 25%. Well, then that's not going to work. We'll eliminate it to the top 50%. Well, that's not going to work. We'll eliminate it to the top 65%. Well, we need more money. So now we're just going to sort of start nickel and diming it down from there. And I just, you know, let's just have the debate. Let's, let's, let's finalize the debate. Let's just not go down the road of nickel and diming. So serious question, now that you're looking at this and you're seeing all these numbers and, you, you know, you've been deep diving on all this and everything else, 35 percent deficit uh, for all this time. Uh, so, I mean, do you think that at some point they're going to come to realize that they're going to have to make cuts? I mean, because, you know, you and I have talked about there being no political will to make cuts. But when you start talking about a 35 percent deficit. Uh, you know, projected in the future. And even if they took all of the PFD, that only lasts for a year or two before just the generation and size of government, you know, it, as it increases every year, is going to push us beyond that. Uh, d does anybody start to acknowledge that we have to start cutting? I mean, is, is that even on the is that even on the horizon? Michael, over the last decade uh, plus that, that I've been at this, I've come to the to the realization and conviction that the only way we're going to ever get people to push back on spending is if all Alaskans have to uh, deal with it, if they all are going to suffer from it, if they all have to contribute to fill the gap. The problem with the PFD, the problem with using the PFD to, to fill it, as we've done since 2016, is only middle and lower income Alaska families are contributing. None of the top twenty, the top twenty percent, are contributing a, a trivial share. You know, sort of like the cost of a Starbucks a day, are contributing a trivial share toward uh, the cost of government, and and they don't care about that. So, and they're the ones who are in the forefront of of you know more spending and more spending and more spending because they don't have to pay for it. 
They're shoving it down on middle and lower income Alaska families. The only way we're going to get pushback, the only way we're going to we're going to start getting spending under control is if all Alaska families, including the top 20 percent, including the business leaders, including the people who hire the lobbyists, lobbyists, including uh, uh, as uh, as as uh, Ben Carpenter put it on the show a couple of weeks ago, uh, including the, the chambers of commerce and the trade associations, if they have to start contributing. If their members have to start contributing, if their leadership has to start contributing, then they're going to become concerned about spending. But as long as we uh, as long as we allow a mechanism, use a mechanism that shoves the cost down to middle and lower income Alaska families, unless the top 20 percent off, we're never going to get spending under control. I mean, Bolay, who's clearly in the top 20 percent, is telling you what what their attitude is. I can do away. I, I don't worry about my PFD. Take my PFD. But but don't tax me. But 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 take my PFD. That's fine. <laughs> we'd have to we'd have to take you know the PFD of sixty five percent of Alaska families to to fill the budget as it is. As long as we can keep shoving it down, nobody's going to worry about spending. Or there, there's not going to be enough people. There's not going to be critical mass. There's not going to be enough lobbyists uh, worrying about spending. I think Chris is kind of echoing what I said earlier. If Brad is complaining about how deep the hole has gotten, does that mean he's ready to talk about cuts again? I don't know as Brad never really stopped talking about cuts except for the feasibility of it. I mean, Brad and I were, I mean, if you listen to this program since 2014, Brad and I have been hammering on cuts. We hammered on cuts for the first four years, five years. Specifically, we were talking about, you've got to get it down to what the ICER said was, you know, first it was 4.1 and then it was 4.0, then it was $3.9 billion as a base to be able to keep it sustainable. And everybody was like, oh, yeah, we can do that. And then <laughs> blew right past it. And at some point, kind of both Brad and I realized there is no political will to fix any of that. You know, it's like the wheels have got to come off the bus before anybody acknowledges that the spending is not there. But, I mean, I still want to see cuts, but I, I just, where's where's the backup for it, Brad? Well, it's structure, Michael. I mean, I wrote, I, I take a little offense at people who, who who make that comment. I wrote the first op-ed, my first op-ed on spending cuts in 2012 in the Anchorage Daily News. And I said, we need to start talking about cuts. Now, this is this is at the same time that Bill Stoltz, Senator, former Senator Bill Stoltz and others in the Valley were still pressing for, you know, the Matsu rail extension and all sorts of spending out in the, all sorts of spending out in the Matsu. It's the same time we were building the, the Matsu campus. Uh, and the Performing Arts Center out, out out in the Mat Sioux. I was saying we need spending cuts, and I got raked over the coals for that. Oh, we don't need to worry about spending cuts. We got plenty of money. You know, stop uh, stop complaining about it. And and I've and I've kept that theme uh, throughout the throughout the subsequent decade. But here's the problem: there is not a structure in place. The 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 fiscal structure is not in place to push for cuts. The reason is the people who are pushing for spending. The top 20% don't have to pay for it. They can push that spending off on somebody else, push the, 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 the revenues uh, that, need, that are needed to pay for it off on somebody else by using PFD cuts and pushing it to middle and lower income Alaska families. The only way we're going to get spending under control is to change the fiscal structure so that the top 20% have to pay for it as well. I mean, that's... Yes, I want cuts. Yes, I've wanted cuts since 2012. Yes, I wanted cuts throughout the entire 20 teens. Yes, I've wanted cuts throughout the 2020s. But you have to have a fiscal structure in place that that creates the 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 imperative for all Alaskans to engage in in trying to push back and trying to get cuts. And the and the fiscal structure we've created is is just that the 80 per, the the bottom 80 percent end up paying for it. The top 20 percent get free government. I mean, you, you talk about you talk about free rides die hard. What's really going on here is the top 20 percent don't want to pay for government. They've had a free ride throughout Alaska's history. Well, since we undid the, the, the income tax in the early 1980s, they've had a free ride from there on throughout Alaska's history. And they don't want to stop their free ride. They just and and to, and to not stop their free ride. They want Alaska to be like the lower 48 they want. You know, astroturf baseball or, or football fields. We went through that that phase. They want they want a great government. They want a big government. They want their teachers to be happy. They want everybody to be happy. But they don't want to pay for it. Right. And 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 that's the fiscal structure we've got in place. And until we replace that fiscal structure, 
and create an incentive in the top 20% to push back on spending, we're not going to get spending cuts. So yes, I want cuts. And the way I'm going about cuts is to change the fiscal structure so that we create an incentive in all Alaskans to push for those push, push for those cuts. I've got great ideas. Others have great ideas on where those cuts can be made. But until we have a fiscal structure in place so that the leaders of the chambers of commerce and the leaders of of, of the other trade groups and the leader and the and the top 20% generally, the people that hire the lobbyists, until they have an incentive to get in the game and push for cuts also, we're not going to get them. So my way of pushing for cuts is to get the top 20% in the game, to get those people who are controlling spending in the game of pushing back on pushing back on spending. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, <clears throat> is our uh, is our guest. Um, and yes, we have talked about <laughs> we have talked about oil. Man, there's broken records. Uh, we have talked about oil. That's part of the fiscal plan. I mean, part of the overall long term fiscal plan that's been put forward by the Fiscal Policy Working Group includes a tax. Well, they're they're talking about a sales tax, which I know is more regressive and not the preferred plan that Brad's talked about. Uh, they talk about uh, you know more oil taxation. They talk about some cuts. They talk about it all, a spending cap, uh, per you know protecting the PFD, all of those things. We have talked about all of those things. So I mean, uh, let's, let's... <laughs> you could come back to that. You just hold that thought and come back to that. Before we came back uh, to the last segment, uh, we were talking about, uh, you know, this whole thing on oil and all this other stuff and taxes. And Brad was said, let me tell you something. And then he got dinged. So, uh, Brad, feel free to tell me something here. Uh, well, I, I, I kind of want to know what uh, I kind of want to know where you're at at this. It's, it's, this, it's the same thing as everybody else. It's the same thing as Al Bole. It's the same thing as I mean, the, the people who are talking about oil. Oil is the solution. It's the same thing as Al Bole. It's the same thing as, as Elise Galvin. Oil is a contributor. It's $400, $500 million. Let's say we even get $600 million, although I think we're, we're, we're putting investment levels at risk at that point. But let's say we get $600 million. The deficit is $2 billion. $2 billion. Get that in your brain. $2 billion. We're not going to close it just from oil. Oil is a contribution to that. We're not going to close it just from Elise Galvin's 2% tax on, you know, people on incomes above $200,000. We're not going to close it from that. We're not going to close it from a sales tax, a sales tax alone. It's going to take a bunch of different things. It's going to take some spending cuts in there, but you've got to motivate people, the people who have the power, who have the lobbyists, who run the trade groups, you've got to motivate them to get in there for spending cuts, not say, not say, what they're doing now, oh, we need more spending. I don't have to pay for it. So, hey, we need more spending. It's going to take a bunch of things. Don't come, don't, you know, continue to whine about, oh, it's oil, it's oil. We're going to get it all. It's not. The deficit is too big. Get $2 billion in your mind, okay? And tell me how you're going to build a package that closes to $2 billion and then it's worth listening. But just whining about, at least whining about her, 75 to 100 million dollar, you know, income tax. Oh, I've got a solution. Uh, 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 you know, Ben talking about a 700 million, 800 million dollar uh, 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 sales tax, but then taking 300 million dollars away or more uh, with a corporate income tax reduction. I, that's not it. That's not going to solve it. Sales tax isn't going to solve it because it's regressive. It's not going to ding the top 20 percent enough. You've got to get in there and put a bunch of things together. That, that create incentives, create revenues, but also create incentives for people to stop stop additional spending and, in fact, start to move back um, on spending. And, and you know, I, all of those things are great contributors, but don't whine at me and say, oh, oil's going to solve it all. You just don't right. talk about oil. Right. I, oil's not going to solve it all. Well, I mean, even if you went with Willikowski's, you know, his pie in the sky number of there's $1.2 billion left on the table. It's a $2 billion deficit. How does 1.2, I mean, you know, uh, it, 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 this is, a, again, it's got to be a holistic approach, right? It's got to be all of this is what the, this is what the, uh, the FBW said that they, it's got to be holistic. It's got to be, 
you know, cuts. It's got to be oil. It's got to be a taxation. It's got to be uh, protecting the PFD. It's got to be a spending cap. It's got to be all those things. Or if you just do one, we're going to be right back here next year. Yeah, exactly right. And, and it's got to be, I mean, part of it's got to be some PFD cuts. I, I, I wish it wasn't because it's aggressive. It, it hits middle and low, lower income Alaska families. It's the worst option for the overall Alaska economy. I wish we didn't have to do PFD cuts, but part of it has to be PFD cuts because we've got way too big a deficit to, to, to put entirely on the backs of, of you know, any one segment, either uh, uh, all Alaska families through a tax, through a, through a flat tax, either the oil companies entirely, everything, every, we got to use all the pieces to, to bring this together. The, the fiscal policy working group was exactly right in reaching that solution. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm just coming off the, oh, income tax is a solution. Look at the lease. Oh, give me a break. Raises maybe a hundred million dollars. Give me a break. 110 million. That's what Donna posted earlier. The numbers say 110 million dollars. That not, I mean, the, not the income tax component. The income tax yeah. component is less than that. Well, that's probably with the head tax at that point. <laughs> I mean, the head tax, the head tax that is nothing more than a than a than a retitling of a portion of the PFD cut. I I just I I you know, people in their words that you got to deal. You got to start with the concept that it's two billion dollars. It's thirty-five percent of the budget that we've got to close, and and work from there. Two billion dollars. Work from there. Yeah. Fill in fill in the two billion dollar hole. Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 some crazy stuff that there's any uh, any one solution out there at this point that's going to fix it. It's gotten so large. There's no one problem that's going to uh, that's going to fix it. And I mean, that's why, quite honestly, I mean, again, the 50 50, uh, you know, we talked about the being the 50 50 uh, PFD. That is a cut. And that's the cut you're talking about. Right. I mean, because the, the statutory PFD is is, you know, significantly higher. But the 50 50 is the original vision. And that's the cut you're talking about. Right. So it's it's a seven hundred million dollar cut over the, over the annual average cut over the next 10 years. I mean, it's it's a huge it's a huge piece of this. You if you if you if you you know stomp on your feet and say it's got to be we got to keep the statutory PFD. Fine, find another seven hundred million dollars someplace. Uh, uh, you've already maxed out on oil. You've already maxed out on whatever you can burden the bur burden Alaska families from an income tax. You've already maxed out all the other stuff. Now go find seven hundred million dollars more that uh, that that you're gonna that you're gonna do. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, the numbers are huge and people who you come to it, I mean, it's sort of like the old, uh, what's the old story of, you know, feeling this part of the cow and saying it's a pig or feeling that part of right. the cow. And it, the elephant, it's, right. It, right. Elephant, yeah. Thank you. Uh, exactly. Big cow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's sort, it's sort of people, you know, people who are, you know, picking one little thing and saying, oh, that's the solution. It's sort it's sort of like that old story of of you know touching the elephant and thinking it's it's something entirely different. It is, it is the whole elephant. We've got to swallow. We got to come up and with enough enough things to get to the whole elephant. Well, that was number one. We I mean we're run we're out of time completely here. Number two, give me a, a twenty second tease here. I mean, where is the budget headed? Well, so the house finally passed it has passed the budget last night, but. But even the House members are saying, well, it's just a starting point for negotiations. So the true answer is nobody knows where the budget's going, but we're going to talk about some of the parameters uh, around the budget uh, in the second segment. All right. We're continuing the Brad Keithley Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. And uh, we're in the weekly top three. Number two, where is the budget going? Last night, some stuff happened. What, is it, what does it mean from here, though? Uh, Brad, where are we at? So the House passed a budget last night, $600 million uh, in deficit based upon the spring revenue forecast, maybe a little bit less than that based upon current oil prices, but current oil prices are headed back down this morning. So uh, gosh, only knows where we're going to, where we're going to end up. $600 million in deficit goes to the Senate. The Senate has, the Senate has with the super majority, the 17 have said they want no deficit and the way that they propose to get the budget back in balance uh, is to uh, close the deficit through P through additional PFD cuts, additional PFD cuts. The House was at POMB 50-50 already down from the statutory levels. 
Uh, the Senate has said that uh, uh, they propose to get a balanced budget by through additional PFD cuts. And actually, the PFD level they're talking about would give them some additional revenue that they want to spend on additional uh, uh, K through 12 spending. So um, there's, you know, we're 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 at a very we're at a very uh, uh, contentious polar opposite situation. House with a big deficit, but with a POMB 50-50 PFD. Uh, Senate saying they want an even bigger budget, but they don't want a deficit and they're just going to tax the PFD tax middle and lower income Alaska families uh, to bring it into balance. Um, the House had held up on theirs for a number of reasons. Uh, one is the tricks that Bert Stedman's known for pulling at the end of the uh, at the end of the session where he, the Senate gets the House operating budget. Thank you very much. And the Sen Senate then holds the capital budget. Uh, combines the two together and sends it back sort of in a take it or leave it, you know, holds it, holds it till the end of the session, till they're right up against 120 days, and then um, sits there and sends it back right at the end uh, in, in what's called a Turdurkin, I think, uh, budget, which combines uh, the capital budget and the operating budget in one big budget. And then the Senate adjourns and goes home and leaves the, uh, the House with either, you know, a take it or leave it proposition to either take what the Senate's done or, uh, uh, or uh, 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 you know, shut down government down because you won't have a, we don't have a government you won't have a budget. Um, so I, the House, one of the reasons that the House had held up was because of that concern the Senate might do it. I understand piecing it together that Burt said he won't do that this year, and so yeah, the right. House, the, <laughs> right, right, the, 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 that's because he's got something else in mind. In my idea, yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's funny. The 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 landmine in his piece talks about this and it and explains it. it says House leaders want to make sure that the Senate will send them the capital budget once the House passes the operating budget. The House majority fears that if the Senate holds all the appropriations bills, they could send the House a turducken, the capital supplemental and operating budgets all merged into one document and force the House to take a yes or no vote on all three budgets at once preventing them from writing their own capital budget that they could be merged with the Senate version. Senate leadership has said that they have no plans to cook up a turducken, <laughs> but there is no great deal of trust between the leaders of the two chambers. I mean, because again, past performance is indicative of future results. We've seen this kind of chicanery and shenanigans from, from uh, Stedman and company before. They, you know, they held hostage the KGB road project. They held hostage you know, previous budgets, like you said, they just throw something together, walk away and adjourn and say, see ya, it's in your lap now. You've got to deal with it because, I mean, he's a bully. That's what he is. He's a political bully getting his way, doing what he thinks is best and screw everybody else. Uh, so, yeah, there's no real, uh, there's no, a lot, a lot, a lot, not a lot of trust going on right now between the two chambers. Yeah. So, and, and, and even if, even if the Senate, I mean, even if the Senate follows procedure, passes the capital budget, passes it over to the house so the house can do whatever they want to do on the, on the capital budget. And, and even if you do to go to conference, it's not clear where conference is going to end up because the Senate is pretty, you know, pretty embedded on using PFD cuts, using taxes on middle and lower income Alaska families to pay for current and, and, and expanded government. Uh, the house is the house, really doesn't have an answer to that. It's just, we want, you know, we don't want to tax middle and lower income Alaska families for it, but we don't have any other revenue ideas. We're not passing along any other revenue ideas. So we just got a $600 million hole in the budget that we're passing along, which, which isn't much better uh, than, uh, than, than the Senate's proposal to tax middle and lower income Alaska families. So you've got a, you've, you've got this, you've got, you know, totally bad solutions on both sides. And in in no real clear path um, uh, to get to the middle, the one the one person I haven't mentioned in this entire discussion is the governor. I mean, right. The governor, you know, is like on. He's kind of the thing. wild card in this, right? I mean, he's kind of like nobody's no nobody's really sure what he's going to do, but he has the power to veto a lot of stuff. And but he's not talking to anybody. Right. I mean, it's just it's like he's like on permanent vacation. And, you know, you elect a governor to be a leader, right, to, to, to lead the state. Um, and, and, you know, this one's decided he's going to lead the state in absentia. Um, so you've got you've got the Senate fighting on one side. You got the House fighting on one side, the governor not giving any guidance. I mean, the governor could say, look, you don't have a you don't have a POMB 50 50 50 PFD. And I'm going to veto the full thing, send it back, start over. I mean, 
the, the at a federal level, you have veto messages that come out of the executive and 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 sort of guide the legislature in uh, in in you know keep them between some ditches on, right. on what they're doing. Here, the governor's not done that, and so we've got we've got a situation in which the Senate's just going to you know huff and puff and say we're going to demand what we're going to demand. The House is going to say we're going to demand what we're going to demand, but we don't have we don't have any proposal on how to fill the hole, uh, the six hundred million dollar hole we've created, and and you're going to have this standoff, and the governor's just you know going to sort of be you know humming around someplace and maybe come in at the end, maybe not come in at the end. So it's the answer is nobody knows where the I don't I don't think anybody knows where the budget's going. The Senate certainly has procedural. I mean, Bert's a procedural master has procedural thoughts about how they might managed to get their way. The House, uh, I'm not quite sure that they're that they have thought through all the procedures about how they get their way, but but they seem to be committed on on a POMV 5050 uh, PFD at least. And where it lands, uh, uh, nobody knows. I I would prefer the governor to step in and sort of set some boundaries and sort of say, yeah. look, I mean, you know, he should he should give him a ha fair heads up to say instead of forcing him to pass the budget, get it all, get it onto his desk and then veto everything. He should, like you said, line out to say, if you do this, this and this, I'm going to veto it. So you might as well save yourself a lot of time and just make the decision now. I mean, this is a lack of leadership from the governor. Let me ask you one question here. Sarah Vance is quoted uh, on the House budget talking about this, and I thought she brought up an interesting point. She says, you're not the only ones pinching your noses in reference to voting for the budget. She said uh, uh, about the plan draw from the CBR and everything else. She's opposed that in the past, but she said she would support using savings in the short term to balance the budget as a long-term fiscal plan continues, which is what the fiscal policy working group said. It's going to take a couple of years. You're going to have to live on some savings and do some things that you're not going to be happy with, but it's a, but it's a compromise. What do you say to that? Well, it's okay, except I've heard it for 10 years. I mean, I've, I've heard it for, you know, I remember one great episode somewhere in the mid 20 teens where you know Lyman said, just pass the budget this year. We'll we'll do three hundred million dollars in, in spending cuts next year. I promise. Just pass the budget this year. Three hundred million dollars evaporated. I mean, you, fool me once, fool me twenty times. Maybe I get a little bit skeptical about these sorts of things. We're we're getting down to the point. We are getting down to the point where we have to have a fiscal plan of some sort, even if in the end it's even if in the end it's going to be extreme PFD cuts, because we're almost out of savings. And, right. and, and to some degree, I mean, the, the Machiavelli could say, yeah, drain savings more because that moves us closer to the, to the, I'll fall off the fiscal cliff date or fall off the cliff date. Um, but it's, but I've heard it before. And, right. yeah. and, and, and the concern is, yeah, it's just, it's just a way of sort of rationalizing doing it one more time. And then I'll make up a new excuse yesterday, next year for doing it again. I, I had to laugh because you just said you remembered an episode from it's like you're watching the best, you know, telenovela in the world. I remember an episode from back in the 20 teens. It's like, is it a comedy, Brad? Is it a tragedy? What do you <laughs> like? I mean, that's what it is. Um, all right. It, it, it's something. It's something. It's, right. Well, it's it's a tragic comedy at this point. You got to laugh because otherwise you'd weep uncontrollably. We decided to ask Brad to stay over because we hadn't even gotten to number three, which I was really looking forward to. Uh, number three on the weekly top three is how a SB 107 isn't going to fix the problem. But SB 107 is Lyman Hoffman's bill. It's the refiguring. It's a new PFD formula, 2575. So government gets 75% of it, but that really wasn't enough. Bert Stedman actually wanted to stuff some other stuff into that. And Bert Stedman's vision of uh, SB 107 is not what you think it is. Brad, uh, I give it to you for the third of the weekly top three. Take it away, my friend. So there, at, 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 at airtime, there weren't any articles on, on this particular subject. So we're going to, I'm going to talk about it, uh, uh, sort of fill in some blanks from yesterday for people. Yesterday, Senate Finance held one of its hearings on uh, SB 107, which is the committee bill uh, to, uh, to solve the, uh, the PFD issue, permanently solve the PFD issue. And, and the proposal is to cut to POMV 2575 um, and, and you know, divert that money, divert 75% uh, of the POMV to, uh, uh, to government. Um, 
And but but to include a provision that allows you to claw back to 50-50, to POMB 50-50, if the legislature adopts uh, certain revenue measures that offset uh, that portion of the PFD cut. You can claw your way back, work your way back to POMB 50-50. And, and while the bill, SB 107, is a committee bill, it's been Lyman's proposal to sort of to, to include provisions to claw your way back to POMB 50-50. Uh, which presumably, you know, Ben Carpenter's Ways and Means Committee is is working on ways to do that. So it's not it's not that unrealistic. The 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 cost of clawing your way back, the difference between POMB 25, 75, and POMB 50, 50 over the next 10 years is about a billion dollars. Um, so you need to have, you would need to raise if all you're really trying to do is offset the 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 drop in the revenues. Uh, or the difference in the revenues, all you really need to do is have that clawback of a billion dollars. Bert yesterday, God love him. Bert yesterday amended Lyman's proposal for that clawback to both shorten the time, which means that which makes it much less realistic that you're gonna that you're gonna get those clawbacks, uh, which is Bert's intent to make it unrealistic you're gonna get the clawbacks. Um, but also to say that you had to do two things to get the clawback. One, you had to raise a billion three in new revenues, not just the billion difference between 25, right. 75, but you have to raise a billion three in new revenues to get the clawback. And, and there's no gradual clawback. It's either 25% or it's 50%, right? So you have to raise a billion three to trigger the clawback. And you have to you have to increase the SBR from its current roughly two billion dollars to three and a half, three seventy five, some some somewhere in that neighborhood, an additional billion dollars plus in surplus by the date by this very shortened date by the date um, uh, that the that the trigger uh, would operate uh, in order to get it. So not only do you have to raise more revenues than is necessary to 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 cover the clawback you have to raise even more revenues above that to generate the surplus to build in the sea and, and hope to hell nobody spells or says, uh, spends that surplus while you're doing it to build the surplus another billion or a billion and a half or a billion and three quarters uh, uh, to, uh, to, to get the claw back. It, Bert's proposal is essentially to put a poison pill in and make sure it never happens. Um, and, right. and, to, and, to, and to have the fig leaf of saying, oh, well, we said, you know, if you want to go back to POMB 50, 50, we gave you a path to do it. Right. But, we gave but you an out. Yeah, but it's an, a totally unrealistic path. Now, here's the deal. Here, here's the thing that just really triggered me yesterday. Uh, pens flying, all that sort of stuff. Here's the vote on the POMB 2575 with Burt's clawback. Here's the vote in support. It was a four to three passage uh, in Senate finance. Stedman, Bishop, and Merrick. Eagle Rivers, Merrick. Yeah, okay. You sort of you sort of figure those three are going to be together, right? The 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 uh, that, that's three. The uh, oh, those in opposition are Wilson, Hoffman, and Olson because they believe the clawback is way the hell beyond what it needs to be. The time frame is too short. You know, you're 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 piling all this junk on just really to kill it, and they voted against piling the junk on. Wilson, Hoffman, and Olson against the fourth vote. The deciding vote in favor of of doing it this way. Jesse Keel. Let's see, where have we heard of Jesse Keel's? <laughs> oh, he was on the fiscal policy working group. Right. That said everything has to has to be done in coordination. And 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 the goal is POMB 5050. And you know, and we're we're all gonna come together. We're all gonna Jesse Keel is the fourth vote in favor of uh in favor of doing it. Just you know, you're you're killing, you're killing. The, the 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 incentive to try to come up with uh you're you're burdening the 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 incentive to try to come up with a solution to unimaginable levels to unrealistic levels uh but Jesse Keel voted for it and and it's just it, it is it is Bert's way of of signaling that that he's going to kill you know he, he wants to impose things that are going to kill uh the PFD the other the other thing about this if you if you trend out and they didn't discuss it in, in Senate finance yesterday. But if you trend out where spending's going, you trend out where traditional revenues are going. Uh, POMB 2575 
75, 25 last two years. <laughs> and then, and then we're back into deficits again. And, and we've set up the procedure. I mean, not, not, none of this is talking about constitutional PFD, even at 25, 75, we're right. back into where the revenue is going to come from. And we're going to be back into, oh, well, maybe it ought to be POMV 2080. Or maybe it ought to be POMV 1585. Or it's just 100, 100, right? It's just 100%. We're going to all take it to government and it'll be fine. But again, even if they took all of the PFD today, based on the spending trajectory and what's going on right now, we'll be back at this place in just two or three years. Well, it, it, it lasts a little, it, all of the PFD gets us a little bit farther than two or three years, but, but, but the, the trajectory certainly is that the, that the PFD goes away uh, or that, or that we go back into deficits if they take, uh, the, if they take all of the, uh, all of the PFD. It's a, uh, but, but Bert is, I mean, he, he's, he's procedurally great, right? But he's using it for all these bad purpose for all these for all these obviously bad reasons. I mean, he's he's using all this trickery for obviously bad reasons. We need a billion dollars to close it. So let's make him let's make him pay a billion three to close it. And let's add a bunch of let's add a billion dollar or two billion dollar surplus on top of that. I, it's not it's not a legitimate. It's not a legitimate proposal. It's just a thinly disguised way of killing of killing the PFD while being able to sort of say, Ooh, I gave the, I gave you an out. If you don't want right. to take the out. I gave you the opportunity. You squandered it. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm the one that's in control of all this and knows whether or not we're going to spend money from the surplus or we're going to get 1.3 billion or all the other kind of, st I mean, Again, we're talking about because <clears throat> Lyman Hoffman's proposal was nine hundred million dollars. He says one point, so you got a forty percent increase right off the top, and then he shortened it down instead of you know twelve years or whatever it was. He wanted to make it even shorter than that and add the uh, CBR amount on top of that. It's like it's like oh gosh, they might they might do a billion three. So let's so let's just put something else on top of it to make yeah. sure that, that it's so crushing it can never happen. And Bert will say, "Yeah, well, let's see. I'm in charge of voting for those new revenues. I'm. I hope yeah. to be in charge of the committee that would allow that would that would you know allow or deny those new revenues to come through. It's we, we don't have we don't have people seriously trying to solve problems. We have people seriously trying to see to show everybody how sharp they are procedurally and how many and how many games they can play uh, along the way. I mean, that's that's sort of what we got. That's what makes this a." a tragic comedy, right? I mean, you right. sort of sit there and go, good God, man. You know. Well, and they don't want to give up any of the behavior that they've had over the last 25 years. I mean, they just don't want to, they don't want to stop. They don't want to, uh, you know, like a spending cap. I mean, that's, a, <clears throat> you know, why would the lunatics want nurses to have keys to the asylum when they're running the place? They don't want that. I mean, that's exactly what's happening now. They don't want to be, uh, they don't want to be restrained in any way. They want to continue business as usual. It's what we talk about, business as usual Republicans. This is exactly what they want. This is exactly where they want to go. And as long as they as long as they can cut the PFD, use it, you fund it by cutting the PFD, they keep their they keep their, you know, the trade groups and the lobbyists and the and the uh, and the chambers of commerce fat, dumb and happy. I mean, they're 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 fine with it because they don't have to pay for it. Yeah, we want more teachers. Yeah, defined benefits. So that's a good idea. I mean, it's just we just we're, we're, it, it's it's trickery to come up with more revenue at the expense of middle and lower income Alaska families. Trickery to come up with more spending that the top twenty percent doesn't have to pay for. Um, it just just goes on and on and on. So uh, what? We're coming down to the end here, Brad. What, uh, what should we be watching out for? What we should be looking for? I mean, this, uh, this bill obviously passed. Now we've got the budgets and everything else coming up. What, uh, what, do you, what, should we be, what should we be on the lookout for? What should we be uh, looking forward to here? Well, I think I, 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 a couple of things. I mean, all, all eyes move to the Senate now, right? The House has done what they're going to do uh, on the budget. So all eyes will focus on Senate and Senate finance about, you know, what they're going to do about the budget that the house has sent over. Um, uh, eyes should focus on 107. I mean, 107 is ready to go to the floor. It passed out of Senate finance as amended, uh, four to three. So it's ready to go to the floor and the Senate's going to hold it up as, as it's, uh, 
you know, we've got a solution. Uh, I think it will be divisive on the Senate floor. I think I think it may uh, break the Senate majority. We may find a fraction fissures in the Senate majority uh, when it comes up on the floor. But, you know, they've got when, when people say, well, we've got to come up with a solution of a fiscal plan. The Senate's going to say we got a fiscal plan. It's twenty five seventy five for now. Right. Um, and with with, you know, this huge kicker that uh, that you've got to put in to, to get back to POMV 5050. So um, it, so the things to watch for what's Senate finance going to do with the budget? What are they going to do with the with the operating budget that's come over from the House? What are they going to do from the capital with the capital budget? And what are they going to do with SB 107? The other place to watch is is House Ways and Means. I mean, people now seem to be primed, ready for a fiscal plan. So all eyes ought to be on Ways and Means about what about what kind of fiscal plan they're going to come up with. Uh, ben Carpenter says fiscal plan will be forwarded to House Finance. Spending limit will be released tomorrow. Other components will follow. Ignorance is no longer a valid excuse, but a tactic. So they're about to drop all this stuff out of the House, which is good. Uh, again, the wild card in all this is what is the governor going to do? <laughs> yeah. the, the person we don't talk about. The person who just, yeah, we don't talk about, has not talked to us. We haven't spoken to the governor in almost, I think it's almost going on almost two years now. Wouldn't respond to my last request for, con I mean, just I, it, no communications with Alaska. Great. Thanks, Governor. Uh, all right, Brad, uh, final thought. I'll let you go here. Uh, give me your your final your final word for well, it, it, the, the the best thing from this morning's program for me was the was the insert you put in from Ben that uh, they're coming forward with uh, with uh, the fiscal plan. I um, I'm not a big fan of doing it piecemeal. I, I hope I would hope that they package it up and and uh, put it in front of house finances as, as one package an understandable total package because you know it's 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 two billion dollars we've got to see we we need to we need to understand how we're filling the two billion dollars and if you if you do it a piece at a time i think that uh, uh we're going to lose sight of what we're what we're actually trying to do and people are going to pick and choose and anyway I, I i hope it's a package but but it's good news that uh, that house fight or the house ways and means is going to come forward uh come forward with a, uh, with a plan because uh, that's certainly what we need. I mean, we can't, we can't continue passing things that have $600 million deficits, right. nor should we continue passing things that, that push the burden mostly to middle and lower income Alaska. Well, almost entirely to middle and low, lower income Alaska families uh, through PFD cuts. We need a comprehensive uh, package that, uh, that uh, does all those things. So, Good news. Good news from Ben. I'll be I'll be looking forward to it. Yeah, no, I think we're all looking forward to it at this point. All right. Um, well, thanks, Brad. I appreciate it. Um, thank you for uh, coming on board and joining us today. We look forward to talking to you again uh, next week. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.